you will hear of wars. And rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Dear friends, I would like to offer a biblical perspective on some of the very alarming geopolitical news that has recently come out. And before we dive in, I want you to know that the purpose of this video is to, firstly, remind you that the Bible told us that in the last days, perilous times will come. And the word perilous means dangerous. It means threatening times will come. So we should not be surprised when the world falls into an alarming state. Secondly, I just want to remind you not to live in fear. Despite the chaos that is in this world, Jesus Christ has said, I will never leave nor forsake you. And so, let's begin. Reuters recently published an article saying, Putin warns the West, Russia is ready for nuclear war. The opening line of the article says, Vladimir Putin told the West on Wednesday that Russia was technically ready for a nuclear war and that if the US sent troops to Ukraine, it would be considered a significant escalation of the conflict. The Daily Mail then published an article that read, French President Emmanuel Macron tells Putin, we are a nuclear power and we are ready. In latest World War III rhetoric, as he responds to Russian leaders' threats about using nukes. And a line from this article says, Macron chastised Putin for threatening the use of nuclear devices and reminded him France also has an advanced weapons program in interviews with French media. Now, there are survival experts out there encouraging people to prepare for any apocalyptic scenarios by fitting their home with emergency power generators, water filtration and collection systems, stockpiling on weapons and food. In more wealthier circles, billionaires are reportedly building huge underground bunkers. Now, as Christians, what are we to make of all these claims and threats and pieces of information coming out? Well, the first thing to remember is that Jesus warned us about wars and rumors of wars to come. He warned us that nation will rise against nation. Is war the biggest sign of the end times? Headlines around the world are constantly talking about conflicts in different parts of the world. And a lot of Christian commentators are having their say on Bible prophecy and especially the fact that the Bible tells us that there will be wars and rumors of wars in the last days. In this video, I want to highlight the distinguishing feature of war in the last days versus any other war previously fought in history. But before we directly answer the question on whether war is the biggest sign of the end times or not, I want to remind you that war is nothing new on this earth. And it's nothing new in the Bible. In the Old Testament, we are given details of many wars. For example, in Exodus 17, Moses and the children of Israel are attacked by the Amalekites. Moses commands Joshua to choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek, while he will stand at the top of the hill, holding the staff of God in his hand and praying. While the battle commences, Moses is on top of the hill with Aaron and her. But the unique thing about this war was that if Moses kept his hands up in prayer, Joshua and the children of Israel would begin to win. But if Moses lowered his arms, then the Amalekites would begin to win. So Aaron and her found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding his hands up, so his hands held steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. This was a unique battle, but it's not the kind that we will see in the last days. In Judges 7, there is the battle between Gideon and the Midianites. 
Imagine this scene. Gideon is getting ready for war against the Midianites, but God tells him something very strange. God told Gideon to send home 22,000 men from the army of 32,000, therefore reducing his army by two-thirds. And if that was not enough, God then reduced Gideon's army to just 300 men. Christian scholars believe that God did this in order to ensure that all the glory was His. Because 300 men going up against an army of thousands would have been a fatal mistake, but for the hand of God. So here's what happened. Gideon and his army waited until just after midnight. They reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly, they blew ram's horns and broke their clay jars and raised torches in the air. This created such confusion in the Midianites' camp, and that led them to turn on each other and slay one another. However, this is not how war in the last days will be like. So, back to our opening question. Is war the biggest sign of the end times? Well, when Jesus Christ walked the earth, there was a day when he sat on the Mount of Olives and his 12 disciples came to him privately with a question that was bothering them. They asked him, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return at the end of the world? And in Matthew 24, verse four to eight, Jesus answered his disciples. He said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Look closely. The first sign that Jesus highlighted in verse 4 and 5 was, watch out for deception, meaning there will be many false teachers, many false prophets, many will be wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. On the second sign of his coming, Jesus said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And isn't that where we are today? So the very first sign that we're told to watch out for is deception and the fact that it's repeated twice, this highlights the importance of it. After Jesus lists the signs of the last days, which are deception, wars and disputes among nations, devastation and disasters in the forms of famines, pestilences and earthquakes and then persecution Jesus tells his disciples that this is just the beginning and if this is the beginning what could be next well Bible prophecy tells us of some interesting battles to come the battle of Gog and Magog described in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is perhaps one of the most debated events in biblical prophecy. Gog and Magog refers to the enemies against whom God will wage an apocalyptic war at the dawn of the Messianic Age. It is believed that Gog is a person who rules over the land of Magog. Now, the who, what, and how of this battle is a contested area among some scholars, with all believing that the Gog and Magog battle is an invasion of some kind but opinions differ on its participants, location, and timing. Biblical scholars also disagree regarding timing of the invasion. Some believe it will be just prior to the rapture of the church and onset of the seven-year tribulation. Others will think it happened between the rapture and the tribulation. Some think it will be around the middle of the tribulation. And the final camp thinks it will happen just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so, according to the Bible, when Gog and his army attempt to overcome Israel, 
God will come to the rescue of his people and will quickly annihilate the invaders by supernatural means. In Ezekiel 38, verse 18 to 22, we are given a picture of what will happen. And here are the details we're given. And it will come to pass at the same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstorms, fire, and brimstone. So this is just a glimpse of the Gog and Magog battle, but there is also another battle to come. The final battle at the end of the world between the forces of good and evil. Armageddon. The Bible tells us demonic spirits will gather all the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. John then tells us the scenes he saw in Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. For he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh, was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. He further goes into detail and describes what he sees. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. So what can we learn from past battles and those predicted to come? Firstly. War is not the biggest sign of the end times. It's one of the signs. The Bible places more of an emphasis on the rise of deception when it comes to the signs of the last days. Secondly, regardless of what comes, God always protects his children. God always defends those who have put their trust in him. And finally, Christians are not to pay attention to one sign over others, but the collective group of signs mark the beginning of birth pains, as Jesus warned. But this is no reason to fear, because we know what is to come. Society changes. Whenever there are major events in a particular country or region, society changes. Go back in time and you'll see this. In early church history, in the Roman Empire, particularly under Nero, 
There was an acceptance in society those days for Christians to be persecuted and even martyred. In the Victorian era in Britain, one of the more accepted signs of success for males included having a wife and family, having a good home, and owning a horse and carriage for transportation. When the Great Depression happened in 1929, society changed and people established new norms like thrift gardens in order to survive. After the 2008 financial crash, society changed. People began to diversify their investments, their savings, and how or where they kept their money. And just look at how many things that are widely accepted today, but 50, 100, or even 200 years ago, they were not the norm. Violence on TV, violence in music and in video games. This has all become the norm in society when many years ago, it was not as prevalent as it is today. Premarital sex was once taboo, but in this day and age, People are making a living having premarital sex and selling it online. These are just a few examples of changes that have happened in society over the years. But what does the Bible tell us about the changes that will happen in society to signal how close we are to the second coming of Christ? Well, the first change that I want to talk to you about can be found in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2, where the Bible says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Let me just list these points to you. People in the last days will turn away from the faith, meaning there will be an apostasy, a falling away. And what does this look like? Well, it looks like less and less people attending church, less and less people professing to be Christians, less and less people practicing Christianity in their daily lives when it comes to things like prayer and reading God's word. People in the last days will pay attention to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. This is the point I want to focus on, so we'll come back to it in a moment. And people in the last days will be filled with hypocrisy and speak lies. This means you will have many who come saying and preaching one thing, but living in a completely different manner. Then the final point is that people's consciences are seared, meaning there will be a coldness to humanity, a lack of love, a hardening of the heart, and this is all because of sin being prevalent in the lives of many. Now, I want to focus on doctrines of demons. Society in the last days will be more welcoming of new teachings, false doctrines, alternative gospels, and this is precisely what the Bible means when it says doctrines of demons. The devil will never come out in the open and present himself. Instead, he will use men and women to spread deceit. And here, here are some of the key messages from people who preach under demonic influence. They will tell you that you will get to heaven by being a good person and doing good things. God accepts you for who you are. It's okay to sin when you've been good for a long time. But God's word tells you that you cannot earn salvation through good works. Salvation comes only by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and turning away from sin. God's word tells you to deny self and to keep your flesh under subjection. And finally, the Bible tells you that the wages of sin is death, and so there is no trade-off between good behavior and sinning freely. So you see, these are doctrines 
of demons. Now, earlier this year, a report was published. Utah District bans Bible in elementary and middle schools after a complaint calls it sex-ridden. The article goes on to say, a suburban school district in Utah has banned the Bible in elementary and middle schools after a parent, frustrated by efforts to ban materials from school, argued that some Bible verses were too vulgar or violent for younger children. Now, the Bible says in Isaiah 5 verse 20, Woe, judgment is coming, to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is what we are seeing. Good is now being called evil and evil is being called good. The world is a very different place to what it was 20 years ago. There are many more threats that we have to contend with, physical threats, emotional and mental threats. And of course, there are many more spiritual threats that we face today. Sin seems much more rampant and chaos is common. You look at the television, you watch the news and look at the entertainment industry and you'll find that there is so much hatred, idolatry and pride that has infiltrated our culture. And if you're not careful, it's easy to be influenced, swayed and even enticed by the evil around us. Despite that, Christians are called not to let their love grow cold in such a time of evil and sin. In Matthew 24, Jesus answers two separate questions that his disciples were asking him. The disciples asked when the fall of the temple in Jerusalem would happen and what would be the signs of the return of Jesus. Both are legitimate concerns for the disciples. One happened very quickly. That was the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, which happened in 70 AD, as the Roman army came in and dismantled Jerusalem. The other has yet to happen. That is the return of Jesus. In response to these questions, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. It is hard to tell whether Jesus is talking about the increased lawlessness happening before the fall of the temple or his second coming. He's likely talking about both. Whatever the case may be, there will be a time when increased lawlessness will happen. The goal of the Christian is not to allow the increased corruption to make our love grow cold we can see an increase in many areas of lawlessness today. Many take advantage of the poor to get rich. Many commit vicious crimes out of impulse for selfish gain. Many have a disregard for human life. And unfortunately, in some pockets, increased lawlessness can even be seen in the church. There are groups of people within the church who live a life of judgment. They will not embrace sinners who sin in different ways than them. Instead of showing love and compassion, they show self-righteousness and condemnation. We need to ensure that we are a people who do not let our love grow cold, but instead we must have a deep love for God. We do not want to be the very people who the Bible speaks of when it says the love of many will grow cold. So how do we make sure not to be included in this group? The only way to ensure our love does not grow cold is to continue having an active and vibrant relationship with the Lord. Many think that Christianity is a ticket to heaven. While 
It is true, in the end, we get to heaven. The Christian life is much more than that. The Christian life is about having an everyday, all the time relationship with the Lord. Jesus put it this way in John 15, 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. As we abide in the Lord, we grow in bearing fruit, and our love does not grow cold. We can and should obviously grow our relationships with the Lord through prayer, reading, and coming to worship services. However, one of the most critical ways to abide in the Lord is by living in a Christian community with one another. The Christian life was not meant to be done alone. It is when we live the Christian life in isolation that our faith often dies. A study was done where a single rat was put in a cage with a drug tablet. The study was to see if the rat would eat the substance. Every time a rat was put in a cage by itself, it partook of the substance. The isolation led it to the drug. They also put the substance in a cage full of rats. Every time the substance was in the cage with multiple rats, the rats ignored the substance as if it was not even there. While we are not rats, the same is often true for us. When we surround ourselves with Christian community, we are much more able to live a godly life. However, we are much more likely to let our love grow cold when we live in isolation. We live in very evil times. The world has always had evil and will continue to have evil until the return of Jesus. How are you combating that evil right now? Do you have godly Christian relationships? I suggest finding a group of Christian people to meet with at least once a month. It does not have to be a big group. However, these are the people you trust your life with. You share the good, bad, and ugly of your life with them. As you do that, you find a place where you can be open and honest about where God has you. Satan is trying to combat your Christian life by making your love for the Lord grow cold. However, surrounding yourself with Christian community, as well as reading the Word, praying, and going to Sunday services will help you abide in the Lord and combat that desire to turn from God in these evil days. So hear me, even though the hearts of many has grown cold, even if godly values, biblical values are no longer held to high esteem in society, I want to remind you that greater is he who is within us than he who is in the world. Jesus Christ is light, and he is the pure and holy light that drives out all the darkness. In Ephesians 5, 8, the Bible says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. The Bible says that we too once walked in darkness. Before we came to Christ, we were in darkness. But God, in His great mercy, opened our eyes to the truth of Jesus Christ, the author of all goodness and purity and righteousness. It is because of Him that we can shine, even among the shadows. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. If you've ever lit a candle in a dark room, you know what a big difference that tiny flame can make. One small spark has the power and intensity to light up an entire room. The Bible says that is what we are like when we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us as a child of God, you are like a candle in a dark world. And when we all come together with fellow believers in one accord as the body of Christ, then 
we can really impact the darkness in this world through the light of Jesus Christ that burns within us. John 1.5 The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So how can we let God's light shine in us in our everyday lives? Well, 1 Peter 4.10 As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. In order to reflect His magnificent glory, God has given each of us unique gifts to serve His body. Some of us are encouragers. Some of us are teachers. Some of us are worshipers. The beauty of the body of Christ is that we all have different but vitally important roles to play. Whatever your gift is, you can use it as a powerful way to let God's light shine through you. So let the light of Jesus Christ shine brightly in you, even in the midst of great darkness.